Hey class, welcome to chapter 26 uh, pertaining to environmental microbiology. We are going to look at a whole slew of really interesting uh, concepts today, a lot of which we have talked about at other points in the course. But we're really going to start to tie together many of the microbial groups that we've talked about and look at the influence of microorganisms on and in the environment that surrounds us. So uh, what I think is really cool is we're going to start with kind of a, a little uh, uh, topic called scoping it out. And we're going to look at some of the key things that we're going to learn um, as we go through chapter 26. So let's start first with uh, looking at the fact that we are going to talk about the first big content topic is the complex relationships and associations that we're going to talk about between microbes and the environment. Uh, we'll see some different relationships in which fungi and other bacteria live in close association with things like plant roots, helping them in symbiotic relationships to uh, gain nutrients, but also provide an environment and a habitat for the microorganisms. We'll look at different environments such as sulfur pits, um, places that would harbor very complex microbial communities. And really where I'm going with this is we're going to talk about two types of uh, elemental cycling. We'll talk about atmospheric elements and we'll also talk about sedimentary cycles and the movement of things such as nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and carbon through the environment in different uh, environmental pools. We'll also talk about these mutualistic relationships. And if you remember, mutualism means that both parties receive a benefit from that association. So we talk a lot about things like green plants and cyanobacteria that are supporting each other in a process called nitrogen fixation. And nitrogen fixation is a process where Nitrogen from the atmosphere is converted into forms that are usable by not only plants, but animals. And then we'll also talk about the aquatic environments and talk about drinking water or potable water that is safe for us to drink. And a lot of uh, water sources require the testing for what are called coliforms, and these are fecal bacteria like E. coli, that is really a key step in managing the availability of safe and clean drinking water for human consumption. So we're going to start first talking about ecological relationships and really the web of life. So anything you see here are key bolded definitions. Things like ecology, which is how microbes behave in their natural habitats. We talked about applied microbiology in chapter one was one of the key definitions. And we saw that this is using microbes in industrial production and food processing. We'll hit a lot more of the applied microbiology aspects in chapter 27, our final chapter of the course, which talks about food and drink microbiology, which is, is the theme of your lab uh, from this previous week where you were looking at uh, yogurt and milk. So we talk about a lot when we're dealing with ecology, we talk about biotic and abiotic factors. Anytime you see bio, bio implies living. So biotic factors are any living or recently living organisms that are in an organism's habitat. There are also abiotic or anytime you see a before a word, it means without. So these are non-living components of the ecosystem. And abiotic factors can include things such as minerals or gases, rocks, soil, anything that was really never living at any point in time, but are necessary components of that ecosystem. So really when we define an ecosystem, we're talking about interactions of organisms and their environment. So this is an interrelationship between not only living, 
but non-living components of the environment in an area. Furthermore, we talk about the biosphere, and the biosphere is this envelope of life that surrounds Earth's surface. And we'll see that the biosphere can actually be divided into climactic regions or biomes. So we'll talk about that in a few moments. But there's three subregions of the biosphere. We have the hydrosphere, which is the water. And obviously, you know that much of Earth's surface is comprised of water. The lithosphere, which includes soil and rock. And the atmosphere, which can, uh, consists of the air and gases surrounding Earth's surface. So really, this biosphere creates the conditions that are necessary for life to exist. Without the biosphere, life would not be possible. So this is what really drives not only temperature, but also things like the gases and moisture that are required for uh, anatomical processes or physiological processes. So again, here's just our organization of the biosphere, which is this envelope of life that surrounds Earth's surface and includes the lithosphere or soil and rock, the hydrosphere or water, and the atmosphere, which is this envelope of gases that surrounds the surface of the Earth. And we mentioned that this biosphere can be further broken down into these climactic regions called biomes places like tropical forests, the taiga, and the tundra. Communities, on the other hand, are associations of organisms that live together and exhibit nutritional or behavioral interrelationships. So a community includes all of the life, such as if we're talking about microbial communities, it could be areas that include bacteria, fungi, and protozoa, all living in close proximity to each other. We can break communities down further into populations. And populations are groups of organisms of the same kind. So humans would be a population living within a community. There's also animals that would be uh, part of our community as well. We also have what's known as the habitat. And the habitat is the physical location in the environment in which an organism has adapted to. And groups of organisms of the same species as we saw are called populations living in that habitat. We also have the niche which the niche is the overall role of each species within a community. And this involves not only the types of nutrition that they consume, but it also consists of the position in the community and also their rate of population growth. So how do we understand the nutritional flow of energy within ecosystems? So really, when we talk about nutrition, we're talking about the movement of energy. And we can arrange these interactions or relationships in either webs, chains, or pyramids. So the illustration that you see on this particular slide happens to be a food pyramid. The base of the food pyramid is always these things known as primary producers. And primary producers are usually autotrophs or photoautotrophs. So photoautotrophs are the organisms that life could not exist without. So autotrophs utilize and convert gases through photosynthesis into usable forms. So our primary producers, things like our algae and certain bacteria can form the basis of the food chain food pyramid. Consumers can be broken down into multiple levels. So we can have things known as primary consumers. We can also have things known as secondary consumers. So for instance, a cow would be an example of a primary consumer. A secondary consumer may then be a human. 
Decomposers are also a very important role, and you'll notice that they are at the top. They really kind of are intact within all elements of the, the uh, food chain or food pyramid. And we talk a lot about mineralization and also bioremediation um, as key components. Mineralization really talks about the release of excess nitrogen into the environment when certain complex organic substrates are used to make microbial biomass. So that's really important. So we're releasing excess nitrogen into the environment um, when organic substrates are used to make biomass. Bioremediation, on the other hand, is microbes playing a role in detoxifying or cleaning up hazardous waste in the environment. And this was a term that we have seen previously in the course. So here is a really nice overview that talks about a lot of the major roles of microorganisms and ecosystems. This is table 26.1 in your textbooks. And we'll see that the producers can be things like bacteria and algae. We also talk about the consumers. Again, bacteria can also be in this group. You're going to see that bacteria kind of can be through all of the different processes. So energy does not cycle. Energy actually is passed along, but there is a certain amount of energy that is lost as heat and is uh, basically eliminated from the system. So food chains provide really a basic image of how organisms feed in a relationship. And the arrows that you see here indicate that this organism on top is consuming the organism below it. So we have our producer, which then cascades up into our consumers. And then we have kind of our last, or in this case, the top carnivore, which happens to be this minnow fish. And then obviously we have the food web, which really shows the relationships between different organisms. So you could have multiple organisms that feed on the same substance. We also talk about our ecological relationships. And we've mentioned these before in a previous chapter. So we have mutualisms, which are relationships that both organisms benefit from. Commensalism, where one benefits and the other is not harmed or helped. And an example of a commensalism is something known as syntrophism, where the metabolic products of one are useful nutrients for another organism. We have synergism, which is where two organisms cooperate to break down a nutrient that neither one could have metabolized alone. So remember, synergism means that the sum of the parts are better than each of the parts individually. So two things working together is more effective than each of them working by themselves. Oop. And from there, we go on to parasitism. Um, parasitism is obviously where one gets its nutrients, and this happens to be a parasite who feeds off of a host, and that host is actually harmed in the relationship. Competition is interesting in that one member of the relationship is actually going to be an antagonist. It is going to give off toxic substances that can either inhibit or kill another member. We also have the predator-prey relationship. Predators actively seek out and hunt and ingest prey. Scavengers will go around and feed on a variety of food sources. So the scavengers feed on living things or dead cells or wastes. I also want to mention, too, we talk a lot about omnivores, carnivores, and herbivores. 
Herbivores feed off of plants. Carnivores feed off of animals. And omnivores can ingest either plant or animal material. We also get into and start talking about the cycling of bioelements. So we never remove bioelements such as water, nitrogen, carbon. However, we do cycle them. They move between different pools in the environment. So essential elements are cycled through a whole bunch of different mechanisms called biogeochemical cycles. And microorganisms are a key part of these different cycles. So there's a theory that talks about the fact that the biosphere, that, that layer surrounding Earth's surface, contains a diverse habitat for life. And it was actually living things that established these diverse habitats for living things. So we're gonna get in and talk about the cycles in two subcategories. The atmospheric cycles, which include the carbon and nitrogen cycles, and the sedimentary cycles, which include the sulfur and phosphorus cycles. So the carbon cycle, the primary thing we are going to talk about is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is used by autotrophs. And remember that autotrophs utilize inorganic carbon in the form of CO2 to basically go through the process of photosynthesis where photons of light are converted into usable forms of energy. Carbon can actually be returned to the atmosphere as CO2 through several different mechanisms. Respiration, which is the process that the body goes through and exhales CO2. Fermentation decomposition, volcanic activity, and also burning of fossil fuels like gasoline and oil and coal. Methanogens can also reduce carbon dioxide and give off methane gas as well. So carbon goes through a process where it is recycled via things like photosynthesis, respiration, fermentation, limestone decomposition, and methane production. Believe it or not, carbon dioxide is used by marine organisms to make the limestone for their hard shells. So, and as we've mentioned, it's removed from the uh, atmosphere during photosynthesis, but then it can also be returned to the atmosphere during these processes down here like respiration, fermentation, and methane production. We also talk about the nitrogen cycle. And nitrogen is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere. About 79% of the gases in our atmosphere are comprised of nitrogen gas, or N2. And there are several types of microbes that fit into the nitrogen cycle. So we talk a lot about four very different types of reactions. The first one we're gonna talk about is what's called nitrogen fixation. And this is, these are important to know for test reasons. Nitrogen fixation involves the conversion of nitrogen gas, or N2, to ammonium, or NH4. So that's the process of nitrogen fixation. Ammonification requires the movement of organic nitrogen to NH4 or ammonium. Nitrif nitrification involves ammonium being converted into nitrates or NO3. And denitrification involves nitrates or NO3 being converted to nitrogen gas. And Pseudomonas is one example of a bacteria that can actually do this process of denitrification to completion. So nitrogen fixation involves N2 to NH4. 
Nitrification involves NH4 to NO3. Ammonification involves organic nitrogen to NH4. And denitrification involves NO3 back to nitrogen gas, or N2. Okay, so we've just kind of gone through these processes here. So please make sure this is a very important slide to go over. Make sure that you understand what is being converted in each of these processes. So let's talk about some examples of nitrogen fixation and nitrogen fixing bacteria. So it's important to know that nitrogen fixation is not an, uh, not an aerobic process and that some nitrogen fixing bacteria do have the ability to live freely in the environment. However, as we're gonna see, some form symbiotic relationships with plants. And we're often talking about the root nodules of plants. So we have a nitrogen fixing bacteria known as rhizobia, and they actually form symbiotic relationships with legumes. And they, the presence of the rhizobia on these root nodules helps the legumes to achieve nitrogen fixation. So they're helping the roots and the plants to ultimately convert nitrogen gas into usable forms like ammonium. We also get in and talk about the sulfur cycle and the phosphorus cycle. The sulfur cycle, as we've seen, sulfur originates from not only things like rocks, but also aquatic bodies like oceans and lakes. And it exists in elemental form as what we call hydrogen sulfide or H2S gas, sulfates, and another compound known as thiosulfate. So many plants and microbes can assimilate only sulfates. However, animals require an organic source. So the majority of sulfur in animals is found in the form of our amino acids. Things like cysteine, cysteine, and methionine. Bacteria can actually help to convert environmental sulfur compounds into useful substrates like the sulfates. Phosphorus, on the other hand, is found primarily in rock. And in order for phosphates to be used, they have to be converted into a usable form by acid, usually sulfuric acid, that can be released by many types of bacteria. And organic phosphate is returned to soluble phosphate by the decomposers. Phosphorus is important because it comprises the majority of our biomacromolecules, such as ATP, which is a primary cellular energy source, our nucleotides, which comprise our RNA, and our DNA, and uh, also our phospholipids, which are the primary component of our cellular membranes. So other types of cycling that occur in ecosystems include toxic substances, which can be converted to less harmful ones, but they do persist and continuously cycle around in the biosphere. And we often talk about a phenomenon called bioaccumulation. And this is where uh, a pollutant accumulates in living things as it flows through the ecosystem. One example that we often talk about is mercury. So we're going to get in now and start talking about terrestrial microbiology, specifically the lithosphere. And we get in with the lithosphere and talk about the soil. And the soil really supports interactions in all sorts of microbial ways. And microbes often serve major roles in many of the sedimentary ge uh, biogeochemical cycles and help to circulate uh, organic materials around. So the soil habitat consists of a few different components. 
we have the humus, which is the moist layer of soil that contains debris that's been decomposed. And we know that our decomposers can usually be fungi and also bacteria. We have the rhizosphere, which is the zone of soil that is responsible for uh, containing the bacteria, fungi, and protozoa that supports the acquisition of nutrients by plant roots. And we have the mycorrhizae, which is where we have this symbiotic relationship between fungi and plant roots. So we can see that relationship of the plant roots, not only with the bacteria, but the fungi as well. Aquatic micro uh, bacteria, we are, are microorganisms rather, is a really complex relationship. So water is the dominant compound as we saw on Earth's surface. About three quarters of our surface contains water. And it's continuously cycled between all of the components of the biosphere through something known as a hydrologic or water cycle. This is interesting, about uh, 317 million cubic miles of water is in our oceans. Next, next one, so 97% of the total water, only 2% going down is found in things like glaciers. So about 99% of all of Earth's water is either in the oceans or in glaciers. So that gives you an account that if we're talking about 7 million cubic miles of water volume, as the glaciers begin to melt, you're also going to see large rises in the uh, Earth's ocean levels. So with the hydrologic or water cycle, water evaporates in higher temperatures. It turns into a gas, water vapor and is able to accumulate in the atmosphere and return through not only condensation, where gas converts to a liquid. You see this often on uh, cold more, or warm mornings where uh, water droplets are on the windshield of your car. And also precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, and hail. And as that water falls back to earth through things like precipitation, that surface water collects and can then be transported to a groundwater source known as an aquifer, things like springs and geysers. And uh, those are other places that water supplies can be tapped for consumption. So our aquatic ecosystems, things like lakes, ponds, and oceans, consider differently in size, location, and chemical characteristics. And this is all driven by differences in many of our, our abiotic factors, things like sunlight, temperature, and aeration. Lakes can be stratified into zones, or strata, as they're sometimes called. And we talk about many of these different zones. So we have the photic zone, which is the surface, and this is the lowest limit of sunlight penetration. We have the profundal zone, which is the edge of the photic zone, almost all the way down to the sediment at the bottom. And then we have the benthic zone, which is the sediment in the lakes that consist of organic debris and mud. There are also horizontal zones, for instance, the littoral zone, which is the shoreline, most shallow portions of water. And we have the limnetic zone, which is the deeper open water. We also have, we can talk about marine environments, which similar to the profile of lakes, but there are a lot of variations in things like salinity and temperature, as well as pressure as you go deeper down. They also contain a zone known as an estuary, and an estuary is where river meets the sea, so fresh water meets salt water. And obviously there's very high fluctuations in salinity and nutrients in this region. The abyssal zone 
is able to extend to a depth of about 10,000 meters. And this is where we're going to find most of our, uh, our, our extremophile organisms, such as our halophiles, which survive in high salt, our psychrophiles, which survive in cold, our barophiles in high pressure, and then obviously, since we are down to a depth of about 10,000 meters, oxygen is absent, so anaerobic organisms as well. We also talk a lot about the photic zone, and this is the most productive zone. This is closest to the surface, and that's because this zone with the sunlight temperature and oxygen levels is able to support a form of life known as plankton. And we have two different types of plankton. We have phytoplankton, which consists of our algae and cyanobacteria. These go through the process of photosynthesis and convert photons of light into other forms of energy for use by the cells. And then we have our zooplankton, which are our consumers that are able to feed, prey, or scavenge. The benthic zone is able to support a variety of organisms, including not only aerobic and anaerobic organisms as well. When we talk about lakes, we also can talk about thermal or temperature stratification. So our three layers go in a particular order. We have the epilimnion, which is the upper region, and that's the warmest. As we go down, right after the epilimnion is the thermocline, and this is the buffer zone between the warm and cool layers, followed by the hypolimnion, which is the deepest and coolest layer. You can see that illustrated in the picture below. Epilimnion followed by the thermocline, and then the hypolimnion is the deepest, coolest layer. There's also a condition known as red tide that is significant in fresh uh, bodies of water. And red tide is really an overgrowth of an organism known as dinoflagellates. And these dinoflagellates are able to produce a toxin that is able to concentrate when ingested into the shellfish population. And as these toxins concentrate in shellfish, humans that eat the shellfish can contract a condition known as paralytic shellfish poisoning. And you actually get these kind of red blooms that form near the surface of the water, uh, consisting of those dinoflagellate. We also can talk about two different environmental conditions depending on the level of nutrients available. We have oligotrophic systems that are nutrient poor, and eutrophication, which is where we have an excess amount of nutrients that result in these heavy algal surface blooms. And when we have this heavy layer of surface algae, it is able to block off the oxygen supply in lakes, resulting in a massive die-off of fish and other invertebrates in that particular environment. So when we talk about aquatic systems, it's also important to talk about drinking water. Potable implies that the water is safe to drink. It's free of pathogens, toxins, odors, colors, and any type of odd taste. However, there are conditions where water is able to be contaminated with pathogens. So we often talk about Giardia and Cryptosporidium, which are protozoans. We talk about Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, Vibrio, and in some cases, mycobacterium, all of which are bacteria that are able to serve as waterborne pathogens. And then hepatitis A, which is acquired through the fecal oral route, and the noroviruses are two viral forms of waterborne pathogens. 
most assays focus on detecting what we call indicator bacteria. Indicator bacteria are also coliforms, things like E. coli, Enterobacter, and Citrobacter. And these indicator bacteria are gram-negative rods. So these gram-negative rods and coliforms are evidence of fecal contamination. So they make very useful indicators in water quality tests. So these water quality assays, there are several of them that we can utilize. We have the standard plate count, which is looking at the number of colonies and gives us an estimate of the colony forming units or CFU in a sample. We could do the biological oxygen demand or BOD. And this is assuming that water with high levels of organic matter and bacteria will then have a lower oxygen content. There are also coliform assays. We have the membrane filter method. And this is basically where after you filter a, a sample of water, you place the filter membrane on a auger dish and you incubate it and you're able to uh, identify and count the number of colonies that were in that filtered sample. We also have what's known as the MPN, or most probable number. And this is a series of presumptive, confirmatory, and completed tests that analyze a sample of water to establish the estimate of the number of coliforms in that water sample. There is no acceptable level for any of those waterborne pathogens or coliforms in drinking water. Just an example of some of the tests that we have talked about. This particular one here, here's our membrane filter technique where we would put a filter between these two collection ports. We would run the water sample through the filter and then we would actually plate this filter and count the number of colonies on the grid of that filter paper to get an idea of the number of waterborne pathogens in that sample. So that is the end of our information for chapter 26. If you have any questions, please feel free to bring them to one of our office hours or hit me up via email with any questions. Have a great day and talk to you soon.